Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Marcus Cole. I'm the Dean of Notre Dame Law School. And I want to welcome you to our inaugural Notre Dame Religious Liberty Summit and the presentation of the Notre Dame Prize for Religious Liberty. Many of you who work in this field don't know me because I'm not a constitutional law scholar and I've not spent a career in the fight for religious liberty. I admit that I'm a business lawyer, a scholar of financial law, um, having taught venture capital and financial regulation at Stanford Law School for 22 years. But when I was a faculty member at Stanford, I picked up my local newspaper one day and I noticed a photograph on the front page of that newspaper and it had a picture of a group of nuns in habits. And I hadn't seen nuns in habits since I was in elementary school. And so I had to read on. And it turned out that the nuns in the photograph had been approached by a group of young women who wanted to join their order. Um, and the order was made up of eight cloistered nuns, nuns who spent all their time uh, together uh, in uh, contemplative prayer. Uh, and the sixth group of women, young women who wanted to join their order, simply had no space in the convent. So the nuns did what any of us would do if we're enlarging our family. The nuns hired an architect and had plans drawn up for the expansion of their convent. And they took those plans and submitted them to the San Mateo County uh, Board of Supervisors for approval. When the county saw the plans, they didn't approve them. Instead, what they did was they decided that this land and this open space was too valuable. In fact, I'll quote, it was too valuable to be wasted on something like prayer. So they condemned the property and took it by eminent domain and sold it off to a developer. I was outraged, but helpless. I didn't know who could help them or what could be done on their behalf. Who could help them? An eminent domain lawyer? But what do eminent domain lawyers know about religious freedom? It was at that time that I started thinking seriously about religious liberty as the most fundamental freedom in our lives and the one that is taken for granted by far too many. And for many years, I gave my frustration to God in prayer. After all, I was a business lawyer. What could I do but pray? Well, as I've said this morning, and I've said many times to the people around me, great change starts with a prayer. Like the movement for civil rights in the United States, it began in the black churches of this country, churches like Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York, Pil Pilgrim Baptist Church on the south side of Chicago, and yes, St. Augustine Catholic Church in New Orleans. Churches were the place where African Americans could gather for discussion and planning beyond the reach of the Ku Klux Klan or the police who were often one and the same. Great change starts with a prayer, like the fall of the Berlin Wall. In 1982, at the height of the Cold War, St. Nicholas Church in Leipzig, East Germany, began organizing prayers for peace each week. First, they started in the sanctuary, but these weekly vigils grew beyond the capacity of the church and started to pour out into the square in front of it. And then it started to spread to other cities all across East Germany until seven years later, in November of 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. Great change starts with a prayer, as it did in Hong Kong when Archbishop Joseph Cardinal Zen walked into a park on the 10th anniversary of the, man, uh, of the massacre at Tiananmen Square to pray for the victims. That prayer, year after year, grew with more celebrants 
going into the park to pray. And today we know it as Hong Kong's umbrella movement. We are in need of prayer. And what would the world be like if we were not free to pray, free to believe, free to live as we believe? In the words of Jimmy Lai, the recently imprisoned Catholic publisher of the Apple Daily News of Hong Kong, Hong Kong's newspaper voice of democracy, Jimmy Lai says, autocrats and dictators all around the world understand that if we obey God or a moral code, we may be less obedient to them, especially when our conscience tells us that what they are doing is wrong, which is why religious freedom is the first freedom that tyrants try to extinguish and why it is the first freedom listed in the American Bill of Rights. The framers of our Constitution understood that without freedom of conscience, no other right matters. Notre Dame is an answer to my prayers. God gave me a great university leader in Notre Dame President Father John Jenkins, and he afforded me with the, expre- uh, to, uh, with the opportunity to express this vision for an all-encompassing scholarly and litigation initiative to bring Notre Dame to the front of the battle for religious liberty. God also provided us with great partners like the Maroon family, whose generosity made it possible for us to put this effort into motion. They gave me the resources to fly out to Provo, Utah, to persuade Professor Stephanie Barkley to come and lead this effort. And God gave us Notre Dame and the power of her name to make the world stand up and take notice. So what makes the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative different from all other efforts to defend religious freedom? To be clear, the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative has, as one of its five components, a religious liberty clinic to litigate cases at both the trial level and all the way up on appeal. But the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative is much more than a clinic. It aims to both create and promote ideas in support of religious liberty, and then to leverage scholarship and ideas in the real world for people whose real rights are at stake. We are, in many ways, inspired by scholars like Michael McConnell at Stanford and our uh, our board member, uh, Doug Laycock, who are both not only leading scholars on religious liberty issues, but also powerful advocates in the courts of law and public opinion. And we are inspired by Seamus Hassan, Notre Dame Law School class of 1985 and the founder of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and his understanding that the fight for religious liberty must be for all faiths or it will fail for each of our own. Our Notre Dame Religious Liberty faculty scholars like Professors Roger Alford, Jerry Bradley, Sam Bray, Diane Desierto, Father Bob Dowd, Mary Keyes, Father John Paul Kimes, Philip Munoz, Dan Philpott, Christian Smith, and Carter Sneed are researchers dedicated to expanding the understanding of the importance of religious freedom and the crafting the key arguments and supporting social science necessary for its protection. Professors Rick Garnett and Nicole Garnett have published extensively about religious liberty issues related to church autonomy and faith-based education, and they have worked with our students this last semester on on a Supreme Court amicus brief diving into these issues. Professor Paolo Carozzo, a leading voice on comparative constitutional law and human rights law, worked with our students on expert testimony that he filed in a religious liberty case before an international human rights tribunal. And our great leader, Professor Stephanie Barkley, the faculty director of the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative, worked with students to file a brief defending Oak Flat, a site sacred to Apaches, the same day she published an article on that topic in the Harvard Law Review. The experiences we've had thus far highlight the existing need for more of this work 
And for cases all across the political spectrum, in our Oak Flat litigation, for example, a well-known law firm had originally agreed to be our local counsel for the amicus brief. But late on the night before the brief was due, the partner called and said that because other partners at his firm didn't want to make the mining companies mad, he had to drop our representation. We heard similar things from a num number of other firms Professor Barkley reached out to, attorneys who are sympathetic to religious liberty and who would otherwise be inclined to help us felt that they had to keep their head down. We faced a similar dynamic in New York when we represented Muslim groups who were speaking up in defense of the Orthodox Jewish community when they faced discriminatory COVID regulations. Law firms in that area didn't want to get on the wrong side of New York's government officials. And it made me reflect on how important religious liberty, the Religious Liberty Initiative is, an initiative where we are unencumbered by those sorts of limitations and have the courage and the will to step into the fight uh, for religious liberty based on principle rather than pressure or partisanship. In Arizona, one Apache leader said, if it wasn't for the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative, we would have had no one on our side. The Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative also includes our program on church, state, and society. This program, headed by Professor Rick Garnett, is dedicated to training law students and lawyers on the law at the interface of the church and state and the tensions that arise when secular interests conflict with the needs of people of faith. The fourth component of the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative is the annual Notre Dame Religious Liberty Summit. Here, we hope to fellowship with others like you engaged in the fight to protect religious freedom and to develop an effective strategy for its defense. Finally, we hope that through all of these activities, we will begin to develop a network of lawyers across the United States and around the world of all types and all practice areas who can identify threats to religious liberty and can connect with us to craft a global strategy to confront those threats. This is not new. There have been clinics, scholars, and conferences. But the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative is the first comprehensive effort to bring all of these resources to bear in a coordinated way. So how can we win the fight for religious liberty together? Well, while we at Notre Dame feel called to do this important work, we cannot do it alone. It requires more effort and resources than we alone can bring to bear. That is why we are committed, we are committed to our annual Notre Dame Religious Liberty Summits. This fight will require the coordinated resources and efforts of everyone in this room and others who could not be here. But we at Notre Dame Law School are happy to serve as the fulcrum on which this effort can be mounted. We want to be at the center of the fight, not bystanders. We want the entire world to know that if religious liberty is in jeopardy, the Notre Dame Religious Liberty Initiative will be there fighting to defend it. To us, if you are a city council, a school board, a state assembly, a federal government, or even the most powerful autocracy on earth, we want you to know that if you come for our religious liberty, we are coming for you. Thank you. Thank you. There are people in this country, because of our divisive politics, who think that religious liberty is about who bakes what cake for whose wedding. I'm here to say that while no one should be compelled to participate in activities that violate their religious beliefs, this is not about the culture wars. In fact, if you insist on painting those who simply disagree with you as bigots, then you are complicit in the deaths of millions of people around the world. As our honoree, Nuri Turkel, will remind us, religious liberty is more than that. 
Religious liberty is a matter of life and death for hundreds of thousands of people around the world. It is a matter of life and death for the Uyghurs in Western China whose only crime is that they worship Allah rather than Xi Jinping. Religious liberty is a matter of life and death for hundreds of thousands of people who live in the 13 countries around the world where atheism is a crime punishable by death. Religious literally, liberty is literally a matter of eternal life or death for the doctors in the United States who are being compelled by state laws to participate in assisted suicide. In conclusion, our president, Father John Jenkins, once wrote an important article about the decline of persuasion in our political dialogue. President Lyndon Johnson said something similar when he said that instead of winning an argument, he would rather win a convert. Those of us who understand the fundamental importance of religious liberty to our survival and to our souls must persuade. We must win converts to this fight. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, my Lord Jesus Christ commanded me to go and make disciples of all nations and to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. As a Christian and as a Catholic, I ask myself, how can I do this if I cannot witness my faith through my actions and in my words? In short, we must defend religious freedom in the United States and around the world because our very souls depend on it. And so does the... And so does the freedom of the world. Thank you.